G'day, my name's Dave Pello, and welcome to another successful immigrant story. Um, today I'm sitting down with David Hodgson. Thanks for joining me, David. My pleasure, Dave. Good to catch up with you. I've met you once before, so. Now tell me, what country are you from? Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe. I was yep. born in London, grew up in Zambia, okay, as, as, as my formative years, and then my parents moved to Zimbabwe, which was in those days called Rhodesia. So that's where I actually came from. Okay, from now Rhodesia. you um, very non-politically correctly um, describe yourself as a, a black, white child? Yes, up. that's right. Was that so, the right words you used? Yeah, yeah. I, I was a, a white black kid. A white black kid. Yeah, right. so a white skin, but internally, I mean, I was a black guy. I grew up with the black kids in Zambia yep. uh, um, in the 50s, and I never spoke English. My first language was Bemba or Chibemba, and I learned the bush, and I learned to track and to make string and to make traps and just lived off the bush, and I didn't really speak English until I got home at night to my parents. Wow. Now, you got sent to South Africa for your education. Yep. But when you went back to um, Zimbabwe, uh, you actually joined the army there. Yeah, correct. So when I was four years old, the independence movements were sweeping down south uh, from Central Africa through into Zambia and so on. My parents thought it was too dangerous for white kids to go to school there. So they stuck me on a train, sent me to the bottom tip of Africa. It's thousands of kilometres, 10 days each way on the train. Yeah, you would have passed through a number of countries. Yeah, four countries. Wow. And we, unescorted, okay, no parents, no nothing. And it was like January and we'll see you in June. So we grew wow. up without parents dealt with apartheid in South Africa because, remember, my in, I was a white black kid. I got my brains beaten out for talking to black kids down there. White kids wouldn't talk to me because I didn't know how to speak good English or Afrikaans. Um, mm. But eventually my parents moved from Zambia down to what was then Rhodesia. Now Did that toughen Zim you up, getting beaten up Absolutely. Up yeah, I learned, I learned to fight and learned to survive. We had to. Yep. Yeah, very quickly on those trains. You yep. get your brains beaten out. Right? Bullying, from my point of view, was actually, you know, it's a bad thing. It's a big topic these days, but it toughened me right up for, yeah. for, for a time like this, actually. Wow. Yeah. Now, when did you end up going to Zimbabwe and joining the army? So my parents moved to Zimbabwe, which in those days was called Rhodesia, in about 1964 or five-ish, I would mm -hmm. think. And uh, so they sent me to boarding school in Zimbabwe then. But of course, we had declared, uh, our neighbours had declared war on us at the time. Mm -hmm. So when I grew up during school years, there was a war going on, we were being invaded. And then when I left school, we were called up for two years at a time, but we were unemployable. So because you, when you left the army, you were, you were one min, month in, month out, month in, month out, nobody would employ you. You might as well stay in the army as a regular. So I joined the army and I joined the SAS, mostly because they, <laughs> they paid more. Okay, oh, good. I, I'm a natural entrepreneur and, and <laughs> I thought I'm going to make some money out of this war. So I joined the SAS yep. and I fought with the SAS for four years uh, behind enemy lines mostly in, in the countries around us. And you up trained stuff. as a terrorist. Well, Does that mean they, the SAS trained you or you no. infiltrated the terrorist training camps? No, I, I did four years in the SAS mm -hmm. and then I left and joined another special forces called the Salu Scouts. Okay, and the Sulu Scouts were a pseudo-operational team. So we became terrorists. We were taught to become terrorists. So guys like me who grew up in the bush, who spoke fluent language and knew all the customs and everything else, we were trained to become terrorists. And we infiltrated their ranks and killed them from the inside. You infiltrated the terrorists' ranks? Yes. Okay, right. Yes. Yeah. You weren't actually a terrorist, you were an undercover terrorist. Yeah, yeah right. if you like. So Good. there's a difference between working behind enemy lines and working undercover. Just to, just to clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> I did get stopped at the border for saying that once in, in a lecture that they picked up on somewhere on, on the, in the internet. Yeah, best, best be clear about that. Not a real terrorist, but you... <laughs> Pseudo-terrorists. And, and so right. what were the... I mean, the only terrorists a lot of us have heard about nowadays are ISIS. So what were the terrorists in okay. Southern Africa? So t terrorists in Southern Africa is a matter of perspective. From our point of view, living in Rhodesia, being invaded, mm -hmm. we're being invaded by two massive armies, totally outnumbered out, uh, by, by 30 to 1. We regarded those two armies as terrorists. Because Which were those two armies? Robert Mugabe's army called Z uh, Zipra, uh, uh, Zanla, sorry, and uh, Joshua, and uh, Joshua and Koma's army called Zipra. One trained by the Red Chinese and one trained by the Russians. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was a communist insurgency into wow. Rhodesia. So we fought against those two armies, but they were, they were what you would call terrorists today. That's what they did. They ca captured and killed civilians, attacked civilians all the time and so on. But they would also take on the military and we fought them close quarter and, and, and uh, distance combat and okay. so on. Mm. And so the side that the terrorists were on ended up actually winning, prevailing, and Mugabe became the um, yeah, dictator so, of Zimbabwe. 
Yes, sort of. They didn't actually win. They, they, they lost on the ground. We won the war, and, uh, but we lost it politically because of international sanctions for 14 oh, years. No. So we were starved into submission. I had no idea about that oh, history. Amazing history. If wow. You think about it, the, it's the same thing in, that I've heard in, in Vietnam, that America was superior on the ground and yeah. had them licked, yeah. but America was beaten at home. Yeah. by political Absolutely. pressure. That's correct. Um, so we were, mm. we had international sanctions. The only people who sanctions busted, there were very effective sanctions, but South Africa, of course, because they were next when we fell, and Israel. You know, everything else we made ourselves. Israel provided helicopters, South Africa provided oil. That's tragic. And mm. so the nations of the world sided with the communists? Yes, because of the propaganda. Well, they didn't see it as a communist. They saw it as a, a racist white regime. Which it wasn't. Okay, we could. You know my story. I was a black. Uh, I was a white black guy. My mates were black. Could all go to the same schools. Could intermarry. Mm. There was no apartheid. That's a huge story. Yeah. Um, but tell me how you came here, because uh, it turned out that after you left the army, you started in mining, yeah. and then when Mugabe got power, um, he essentially sent you all broke. Yes, that's right. So. When the war ended, there was a ceasefire, and then the Lancaster House talks and independence came, became Zimbabwe. Mugabe took over, and he promised there wouldn't be a witch hunt for any... He uh, didn't want the whites to disappear and leave the country destitute of skills. But the military left, most of them. I stayed. I was one of the only SAS guys who stayed. Um, I had a significant fishing company, a, a very large commercial fishing company, and two mines. Mm -hmm. um, two years later, Mugabe formed a mineral marketing board. It was a socialist government. They formed a mineral marketing board, put the price of the minerals down, forced us to sell the minerals to them, put the price down, and put the minimum wages up, and intentionally put junior miners out of business overnight. So we came to Australia, my wife and I, with a, a, a handful of sapphires from one of our mines on mm. a three-month holiday visa, which means you can bring in 300 Zim dollars per family. That's all you could take in a foreign which exchange. Is very little. Nothing, yep. yep. Anyway, we came here for three months to see if we could find a market for our sapphires. While I was here, I got accused of blowing up a squadron of British Hawk jets back at Thornhill Air Base in Zimbabwe, which was one of Mugabe's air bases. And you hadn't done this? No. But you were now essentially a, a political refugee? Yeah, that's right. They were strangling my mother and they were saying, when's he coming back and so on. You know, these are blown up, he's out of the country, uh, mm. joining dots, which were wrong. But I was one of the only guys left in the country who did that as a day job in the past. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's logical. But there was no justice system. Guilt by system. profession. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, but there was no justice system and I couldn't go back. So mm. I tried to get into Australia. Uh, I didn't have time. They said, forget it, you're not a refugee. So I had to go back to Zimbabwe and, and, and they were waiting for me at the airport. But my plane stopped in Singapore to refuel. So 1982, there's no direct flights. And I hopped off the plane and managed to get a two-week visa just to go and look around Singapore as a tourist. Brilliant. And I went from, I knew that there was an ex- New Zealand, uh, a New Zealand ex-Special Forces guy who was the operations manager of a company called Solus Ocean Systems. Is that where you picked up the word blimmin'? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we use that word. It's, I think it's Cockney somewhere. Okay. <laughs> but either way, I, I lied my way into a diving job in Singapore. Okay, it was a survival thing. And yeah. um, my wife's plane went to South Africa to pick up our two kids with, with the grandparents, so she was safe. But mine stopped us who I got the job. And within a few weeks, I was 400 feet below the Sea of Japan as a totally not knowing what I was doing for, for 35 days at a time. And and 400 feet is incredibly deep. Uh, that's pretty much the edge of human capacity, isn't it? it? It's not now because the equipment's a whole lot better. But in those days, in the early 1980s, you were pioneering at 400 feet. It's a major barrier. Not many could go below. In, mm. in Central and South American oil fields, they were, they were getting a bit below that. We were down to 450, 480 feet. But it was certainly I can't even deep. imagine um, what it would be like spending so much time so far beneath the water. Yeah. Uh -huh. You're there for 35 days at a time. You then should come out for 35 days at least, but I came out just to get my breath and went back in again. So I was in and out of SAT when for six months. When you say catch your breath, a day, a week? Uh, three days, right. because when you come up, you, if you understand you've been breathing helium, almost pure helium, a little tiny fraction of oxygen, it's very, really? very light. But as, as you come up, it takes four days to decompress and they bleed the chamber, bleed the chamber. And when you get out and open the door and you breathe this atmospheric air, it's like breathing water. You can't breathe, you just gag. Wow. It's so thick. So you'll sit down and rest and rest, and usually you'll stay out for a long time. But I was the only medic on board the ship, 
and, and they have to have a medic in the chamber. In the SAS, we're all trained as medics. Mm. So I always went straight back in as soon as I could because I needed the money to get my family out of Africa before Mugabe got to them Yeah, because they wanted to talk to me. So how long did it take after you, after they they started strangling your mum um, <laughs> to actually getting your whole family out? What was the period uh, of time? It, it took about a year from, from the time that I got that job in Singapore. So okay. my wife came out halfway through the year. And then, uh, and then at the end of that year, our two sons, uh, my wife, were, you know, she was only with me for a week, then she went back. So at the end of a year, the whole family. And so there. your immigration to Australia, was that by design or by opportunity? Well, when we uh, got back to, when we're all living in Singapore, now we're stateless. Totally and utterly stateless. My wife was still uh, could go back, but I couldn't. So we decided where we're going to live. And we'd been to Australia for three months. My brother was here. Okay. <clears throat> we said, That's, that place is heaven let's try and get into Australia. So we spent the next three years going yeah. through the immigration process. Yeah. Once I had a hundred grand in the bank, they suddenly let me in. And where did you, oh wow, and where did you land in Australia? We landed in Perth, so we just chose Perth off a postcard. I was in a sat chamber diving in, in the Gulf of Vietnam, uh, Gulf of Siam out of, out of Vietnam. It's almost like throwing a dart, isn't it? Yeah, it is. A guy showed me, he got a postcard from his girlfriend, there was no email in those days, and he, it was Perth. Everyone's windsurfing. So when I came out, I telegrammed my wife and I said, hey, that looks like the place, let's stop there. Yep. So we just chose it off a postcard. And when and what brought you to Queensland? Uh, we stayed in Perth for about five years, built business there, and eventually I sold the business because my brother was in Queensland. We went over to visit him up in far north Queensland. Mm -hmm. Loved the look of the bush. It was so different to the desert in Perth. Right, yeah. And he invited me to join him on an avocado venture, because wow. that's what he is, he's a horticulturalist. Okay. And so we decided to move over to far north Queensland in about 1989, I would say. Okay, and so your brother brought you over here? Well, we, we, yeah, so we went to Far North Queensland, yeah. uh, Cairns, uh, Cairns, Atherton, Tablelands. Family's region. a good reason to move to another country. Yeah, that's when, right. When you're choosing it, and the other side of the country yeah. as well. Yeah, correct. So just briefly now, tell me about what you're doing now, what your vision is and, and your purpose is. Okay. Uh, keep in mind, we left the Atherton Tablelands and moved here to the Sunshine Coast about 18 years ago, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I, I had noticed, of course, I, I watched in, uh, in Zimbabwe the collapse of the place. I, I, I was fully understood what Mugabe had done to the people. Whether you're black, white, or communist or not, corruption's corruption. And through corruption, he trashed the nation. He trashed his own people for his own self-centeredness and, 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 uh, and put everybody into poverty and starvation. Trashed the, the breadbasket of Africa. Mm. So I thought, wow, we're going to live in Australia. And when I looked around at Australia, I realized the same corruption uh, was here as well, albeit more sophisticated and covert. But we had a lot of corruption here. And I thought, Can you give an example of that? Because that's pretty hard to hear that well, look corruption at the, in Australia. Look at the Royal Commission like into Mugabe. Banking right now. Hmm. Look at the Royal Commission into Banking. So they're, they're charging dead people fees, they're, they're, they're charging fees for no service. There's a myriad of things that, that we just think, oh, we, we shouldn't have that, but it's systemic. It's mm. going on everywhere. Uh, the, the point was, though, corruption was there, corruption is here, and I thought to myself, I don't want my kids to be like the kids in Zimbabwe because they're starving uh, from a prosperous nation in just a few years. And if that happens here, I haven't looked after my kids. So let me find out what is the root cause of this corruption. And as I looked at that, I found it's a, a culture of, of greed and self-centeredness, a culture of maximizing self-interest at the expense of others, which permeated everywhere in the world. And we're actually taught it, whether inadvertently or on purpose. But we go to school, we go to university, tertiary and so on, we are taught to compete in the marketplace, irrespective of the consequences. Recklessly, we want market share. And we don't care if we put our fellow Aussie out of business. We don't care if we inflict financial hardship onto that person, which in, in every state in the country, financial hardship is the biggest cause of domestic violence. So, and DV is the biggest cause of homelessness in women in every state in this nation, all stemming from the root cause of greed and self-centeredness. If we can change that, and in saying that, the whole, almost all social distress and human misery comes from that same root cause, economically, socially, politically. So if we deal with that root cause, we then start to stop the systemic poverty and the systemic distress, and then we can mop up the symptoms and mop up the water. So I built our business with a view to fixing that culture. I thought if I could build a big enough company 
as an immigrant into a country that I was looking at critically saying, wow, look at this place. We've beautiful place. We have to make sure it doesn't decline and deteriorate into a mm. Zimbabwe or a Venezuela. Yeah. That's why I built the business. And what is your business? I, I thought to myself, the way to do this, I have to learn how money works in this country. I need the money so that I can acquire, uh, so I can grow the business. Or, uh, uh, I didn't want to grow organically. I wanted to grow by acquisition. So we became a significant company very quickly so we could wield influence and money for, for initiatives. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we did that and we did it by buying businesses in sectors of the economy that we thought were resistant to economic downturn. So, because we knew, as I learned to become a financier and as I learned about money and an international financier, I knew that there was unsustainable debt around the world and we were going to collapse mm. in 2008. So we shored all of that up by, by buying into sectors like energy, IT, water infrastructure, financial services and so on. We're also in health and fitness, but that is not resistant to economic downturn. It's just my <laughs> wife's baby. We had a big health club and she loves it. It's a women's health club. Nice. <laughs> That's, um, and how do you implement culture change through that business okay this is this is fascinating yeah it, it seems impossible it seems fanciful but, yeah but you've got stories of it succeeding absolutely and it, and it's the same concept of Wilberforce it, it must have they must have looked at you off your face you will never William Wilberforce who helped abolish the global slave trade from yeah, England the transatlantic slave trade exactly mm. and 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 they did it through a, a sustained campaign of public persuasion Okay, and, and they absolutely mm. they changed the economies of those nations because that was where the labor came from. So in mm. our case, we actually have to set about proving the concept. Okay, so we're saying to people in the marketplace, competition or profit-driven capitalism in, on its own cannot work, it never will work, never has, and it's always going to descend into anarchy. Look at Zimbabwe today, okay, or Venezuela. So that's what's happening. If we change that to a more holistic form of capitalism, because capitalism is what works. Socialism and, co and communism and all the other isms don't work. Yeah. We know that. Capitalism works, but it's got to be holistic. People, profit, planet, equal proportions, equal importance, uh, covered with a culture of caring and sharing. If we do that, we actually create prosperity. Uh, prosperity can only come from human enterprise. If we had all the oil in the world under this building and we didn't use oil, oil is not worth anything. Human yeah. enterprise. So we need humans, we need enterprise, we need to make sure those humans prosper. And so we have to do that, physically do it, and then prove it. Say, look what we did. And we've done that in this company over and over again. And we've got the stories. And I lecture all over the world at universities and the media, all over, showing them, look what we did. Mm. I get asked to talk at economic summits all over the world, some of the biggest in the world. And I'm not an economist. But they asked me to come because they want proof of what's working because they know what they do doesn't work. We'll put some links beneath this video in the description so people who want to have a look at some of those examples and some of those lectures sure. that, that you have, we can show it to them while keeping this one on track. Mm. Um, now, if you were Prime Minister or if you were able to run the country, if you were <laughs> Supreme Leader for long enough to, to change three things yeah. about Australia, uh, in particular, what would they be? Well, this is going to shock a few people, but I would deal with three major issues. One of them is uh, water, one of them is immigration, and the other one is energy. Okay, and I think water can be dealt, uh, well, I, let's go to energy first. I think energy can be dealt with almost overnight, okay, because we're getting all these blackouts, and we've got a whole lot of problems going on because we have this aversion to coal. We think that coal is going to trash the planet. However, coal is still the, the world's cheapest baseload energy source, mm. and we can clean coal up to 90%. In Japan today, coal, the new power stations, of which there are 725 now in operation, on 90% re reduced emissions. Right. And it's still dirt cheap. Yep. Okay, through the Healy and, and the CCS uh, um, systems, which yep. are basic stuff. We can do that. There's another 1,100 coming online in the Asia-Pacific Asia region. Coal-fired power stations that are burning black Australian coal and, and uh, emitting very few emissions. So I would work on that, okay? It seems sensible if you can um, reduce 90% of the emissions from it. Absolutely. That's huge. And still keep it cheap. And still keep it cheap. Yeah. yeah. The, the big thing about this, Dave, is the unintended consequences of just trashing the coal industry. Of course. Yeah. So last year I was... Most expensive electricity in the world is in South Australia. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, I was asked to talk uh, or, f or be a member on a committee last year in St. Moritz in Switzerland that uh, formulated the investment policy for eight 
faith ba or for eight religions, okay? So not just Christians, but eight religions. Three trillion US dollars. And, and I was asked to come on, the, on, the, on a subcommittee, this is for the UN, that represents the 600 million evangelical Christians around the world, okay? So I'm on that committee putting in policy for for three trillion US dollars is faith-based investment dollars. Wow. Yep, okay, so again, I'm not an economist. They want me there because they see what we do works, okay? Yep. So in that, they, they, they screen out, they negative screen various areas because it's faith-based. So if they're Jews, which is religions, they're gonna say, we're not gonna invest in pig farms because we don't believe in pork. Yep. And we're not gonna invest in coal because it dirties the environment. So they negative screen out all the stuff that doesn't, they think doesn't comply with their faith and they positive screen other stuff in. And when I sat there and looked at it, I said, you guys, we have to understand that if we negative screen out coal and we don't invest in coal, uh, we over uh, around about 100 million people will freeze to death this year, yeah. mostly in India. Yeah. Okay? They will die because of our decision because we haven't thought it through. Yes. So we need to think it through better than that Brilliant. and we clean up coal. This is why we bought a coal mine. So we can go in there with a different culture and we infiltrate just like I did in the Salute Scouts. This is all life's training. You go in there and clean up coal from the inside. That's how you clean up stuff. And therefore we can have a huge influence on the rest of the industry. Guys, look, we can still keep coal. I'm not against renewables and clean energy. It's a, like I said, let's create an enterprise out of it. What a pleasure. Yep. But don't trash coal because it can be cleaned up. Right. So I would do that. In water. Term, water, the, we live on a continent that is drying physically drying, okay? Look at the Murray-Darling at the moment. We mm -hmm. are actually, and, and that, nothing to do with the floods in far north Queensland. The, the continent is drying. Uh, we also, we have such a small population here that, that our infrastructure costs so much and so on and so on. But if we think about it carefully and we create, we, we bring water into central Australia and there's lots of feasible ways of doing it. Some of them are not viable doesn't matter if they're not viable because we should be driven by vision and not money, not profit. Viability comes second, vision comes first. So we should be driven by the vision of we need to green this continent. We need water in the center of the continent. And that is quite easily done by uh, various methods, but the best one would be piping water from Papua New Guinea. There's, there are trillions of megaliters, of gigaliters in PNG Southern Highlands. And a Piping water from New Guinea? Yeah. It's been done, the, the, the feasibility wow. is done, Dave. And it's, it's a, we can bring that at the very sound least, incredible. yep, we can bring at the very least eight gigalitres. We're not even using day. the water we've got here in Australia. We're not using it wisely, no. Like the Bradfield scheme is, 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 is that feasible, viable? Yeah, well, it, it, feasible, but not necessarily viable. But th that, it doesn't matter if it's not viable. Entrepreneurs should still get behind it because they have an excess of wealth. What are they going to do with the wealth that they've got so much of? This is half of the policy of teaching people a change of culture. Right. The people that have the capacity to create wealth should use that wealth for the better of everybody. Yep. Okay. And if they do, everybody prospers. The, 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 you know, wealth becomes infinite if you do that. Yep. So they should be getting their heads again and say, we will fund this. Not the government, because the government's the people's money. Yep. We will fund this for the good of all, and including ourselves. Yep. So... Water from New Guinea, and New Guinea loves it, the government loves it there. It comes down by gravity. There's hydro all along the way. They can put about eight or nine hydro stations on there, each 100 megawatt uh, uh, um, power stations. Those can then power uh, desal and so on. So this is broad vision, but mm. that is actually feasible and viable. Yep. Okay. And it will bring eight gigalitres a and day. And why do we want to green the centre of Australia? This is the other thing, immigration. We cannot, we don't even have a domestic market. We, we, what, the reason Holden closes down in Adelaide, the reason all our manufacturing goes offshore, we don't have domestic markets. We rely heavily on a global market and we go to cheap labour sources, which is not a good thing because it encourages sweatshops, it encourages all the things that people who are thinking about caring and sharing in an economic sense should be working against. Okay? Mm. So essentially then, if we had, and, and this will trip up a lot of people, but if we had 70 million people living in this country, who were screened, I'm not saying crash our borders open, I'm saying we need like-minded people. Okay, like -minded Contributors, builders. Builders, so, so, so people, entrepreneurs, people of enterprise, mm. SME owners who want to come in, but I would have a school The kind of, of immigrants that came here in the first part of the 20th century. Sure, mm. sure. So the, those folks that came in, whether black or white, okay, it's not a white Australia discussion, mm. it's more a case of are we like-minded? And like-minded means 
you guys have got this culture of caring and sharing in the economy that you figured out and now it works. You've, you've created a just nation, mm. okay, a nation of justice, a nation where everybody's, we, 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 if I come to do business with you, Dave, my objective is for you to prosper as well. Yeah. Okay, it's the spirit of goodwill in business. And the problem most people will have with a plan like this is when it becomes compulsory and it's imposed and forced on people. But that's not what you're suggesting, that the government force people to pay for these things. No, what, what I would do... it becomes culture. Yeah, it becomes culture. So, mm. so public policy follows culture change. You know, take smoking. Mm. Years ago, you know, smoking became... We got sick of it, we, it's smelly, and people annoy... And we started whinging and performing, and the culture became, you go and smoke outside. Well, public policy followed, and now it's illegal to smoke inside, and the mm. ashtrays have gone out the planes and everything else. Yeah. But the, the, my point is that in order to get an ABN in Australia, this is an immigrant or anybody, you would go through a school of enterprise, even if it's a six month course, but it would teach you the culture. It would undo a lot of the, 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 the philosophy, the philosophy of competition for the sake of profit. And it would instill the understanding of where is wealth created, where does mm. it come from, what happens if you plunder the people. Okay, so change that into a different culture, as I said earlier, caring and sharing, and you will end up with uni universal prosperity and human flourishing. And you can't argue the case. There's no argument against that. And it's doable. We've proven it over and over. We've got lots of examples. Brilliant. But I would bring, you wouldn't get an ABN unless you went for six months through that course. And you came out and said, wow, I know how to do business where everyone's going to prosper. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, very revolutionary ones I'd like to <laughs> probe further. We need new ideas. At another time. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, certainly worth having the discussion. Yeah. Tell me, if s there's anybody watching who's currently finishing school or finishing university mm. and about to head into the real world, what kind of advice would you give them? Advice that served you well, perhaps at the same point, or advice you wish you had have gotten uh, at the same point? Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's, there's two things I would suggest. The first one would be do what you're good at, okay, because we're all good at stuff. We're actually in our DNA. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a reasonable teacher, unfortunately. don't like public speaking, but I am. <laughs> so I do that, okay, but I would be hopeless at managing a childcare and, and looking after babies because I'm not good at that. So do what you're good at because if it's in your DNA that you're good at it, singing, you know, leadership, whatever it might be, you will prosper in what you're good at and it'll be easier for you. And the second thing is more of a cultural thing and that would be make yourself so valuable to people that they can't do without you. And that includes even in your social interactions, even in your marriage, like my wife says to me, if you die, I'm coming with. I don't want to live in this world without you because I'm valuable to her. Like I do all the cooking, I make the beds, I do this. Sorry, man, it's just what I do because I don't <laughs> want her to do it because I love her. I want her to be relaxed when she comes home. I'm high energy, so I make myself so valuable to her that she just comes home and she can watch TV and chill out. She works hard here. She's managing 32 companies, the finances. So... That's, you make yourself so valuable to everybody, even on Facebook, even socially, business, they can't do without you. You will prosper, you'll prosper wherever you go. That's brilliant. Uh, very good advice, no matter where you're in, whether you're flipping burgers or, or working in the upper management of a multinational company, making yeah. yourself invaluable. Yeah, that's um, right. That's easy to do. And the world would be a different place if everybody had that attitude of service. Oh yeah, if you cared for people, one of the first the business I had in Perth was a motorcycle business and I knew they didn't like me because I was an employer and they're employees. This is an unbelievably strange social divide in this country where as soon as you employ someone, everybody hates you. Right, yeah. And so I looked at this and they hated me more because I was an immigrant and they, they, I could hear them calling me a refo, a refugee, <laughs> in the background in the workshop of my big motorcycle business. I thought, how do I fix this? How do I get so valuable to these guys? They love me. Mm. So I got them all together and said, guys, what are your dreams? Because I'm already paying them way above the award because they were specialized Ducati people. I couldn't afford to lose them. And I wanted them to prosper. I said, what are your dreams? And they, they just said, we want you know, this and that. And, I, and the funniest thing was they wanted to race motorbikes and beat the Japanese mark. These are Ducatis, Italian, European bikes. They wanted to beat the Japanese. And I said, is that your dreams? They all said, yes, we'd love to do that. I said, okay, let's buy a bike. Let's hot it up. Let's take them on. Let's get out to Wanneroo in Perth and let's flog the Japanese. And so I did that. I pumped money into it. <laughs> yep. The Japanese bike shops, that is. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did that. And we started to win the Thunder Bike Series. And then we started to beat the Japanese bikes in the Formula One races. And my employees became so famous. They were in the media. Their self-esteem was up. They were so happy simply because they cared enough to work with their dreams. And they grew to love me. There's one of them still phones me 30 years later. This was in the early 1980s. Wow. Still phones me. Every, every milestone in my life, he phones me from Bunbury and W. That's awesome. Yeah. 
very good advice and a very good success to be emulated. Thank you very much for sharing your story with us, David. You're very welcome, Dave. My pleasure.